history and lore of the American frontier have long been dominated by an iconic figure, the grizzled, gunslinging man going it alone, leaving behind his home and family to brave the rugged, undiscovered wilderness. Daniel Boone, one of the most celebrated folk heroes of the American frontier, renowned as a woodsman, trapper, and a trailblazer, twice captured by native warriors, he earned the respect of the Shawnee for his backwoods knowledge and was even adopted by the tribe's chief of Blackfish while being held captive. In several encounters, the tribal connections he had forged helped him save the lives of white cohorts the Indians wanted to kill. And with Boone traveling frequently, surveying land and blazing trails, his wife Rebecca provided much needed stability and labor, bearing him ten children while keeping home fires burning as they moved from Virginia to ever more rugged settlements in North Carolina, Kentucky, and Spanish-controlled Missouri. If we start to think of these individual heroic men as participants in really rich sets of social relations, it makes them come alive in many ways that are more than just running around with a rifle in their hand and a knife in their teeth looking for trouble. So how does the traditional understanding of the American frontier shift when women's experiences are accounted for? Today we look at several women who, while birthing babies, managing homes and businesses, and engaging in the political lives of their communities, quietly made their mark on the American frontier. Molly Brandt, Native American diplomat and spy. The daughter of a Mohawk chief in upstate New York and consort of a British dignitary, Molly Dagawadonte went on to become an influential Native American leader in her own right and a lifelong loyalist to the British crown before, during, and after the American Revolution. Born in 1736, at a time when the Mohawk, part of the larger Iroquois Federation of Tribes, were increasingly subject to European influence, Molly grew up in a Christianized family. In 1754, at the age of 18, she accompanied a delegation of Mohawk elders to Philadelphia to discuss fraudulent land transactions, a moment that is cited as her first political activity. Molly met Sir William Johnson, a British officer during the French and Indian War, who had been appointed superintendent for Indian Affairs for Northern Colonies. After his wife's death, she became his mistress. And although her race and class prevented them from being officially wed, they were common law married and had nine children together. Johnson had acquired 600,000 acres of land in Mohawk Valley, and Molly, like other women of her time, came to manage a large and complex household, entertaining dignitaries both European and Indian. Their partnership proved politically fruitful, giving Johnson a familial connection to the powerful Iroquois tribes and earning Molly, who hailed from a matrilineal clan, increasing prestige as an influential voice for her people. During the Revolutionary War, Molly and her family, like many Indians, sided with the British, who promised to protect their lands from colonists encroachment. Known as a persuasive speaker, she is credited with convincing Iroquois leadership to fall in with the British camp. Throughout the war, she acted as a spy, passing intelligence about the movement of colonial forces and British forces, while providing shelter, food, and ammunition to the Loyalists. When they ended up on the losing side, Molly and her family fled for Canada, where she and other Loyalists established the town of Kingston. After the war, the British paid her a pension for her services. Mad Ann Bailey, Frontier Scout and Messenger. Ann Hennis Trotter Bailey, known as Mad Ann, worked as a Frontier Scout and Messenger during the Revolutionary War. Originally from Liverpool, England, Ann sailed to America at the age of 19 after both her parents died. 
She eventually married a veteran frontiersman and soldier named Richard Trotter and settled in Staunton, Virginia. Richard, who joined the Virginia militia as tensions between frontiersmen and Native Americans grew, was killed in the Battle of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, in late 1774. After learning of her husband's death, Mad Anne showed her mettle. She dressed in buckskin pants and a petticoat, left her son with neighbors, and sought revenge. With a rifle, hunting knife, and tomahawk in hand, Anne became a scout and messenger, recruiting volunteers to join the militia and sometimes delivering gunpowder to soldiers. She curried messages between Point Pleasant and Lewisburg, West Virginia, a 160-mile journey on horseback. Her most famous ride took place in 1791, after soldiers at Fort Lee got word that the Native Americans were planning to attack, and discovered that their gunpowder supply was desperately low. Anne galloped to the rescue. She rode the 100 miles to Lewisburg, where she switched horses, loaded up with gunpowder, and rode back to Fort Lee. Her journey was memorialized in an epic poem by militiaman Charles Robb, Anne Bailey's Ride. Anne remarried to John Bailey, a member of the Rangers, a legendary group of frontier scouts in 1785. As the group worked to defend new settlements from Native American attacks, Mad Anne once again used her skills as a scout and courier. After her husband's second death, she spent the rest of her days living a solitary life in the woods. Jemima Boone Rebecca Boone wasn't the only formidable female in Daniel Boone's family. His daughter Jemima earned her own spot in the history books on July 14, 1776. That's when a Cherokee Shawnee raiding group abducted Jemima at the age of 14, along with two other girls while they floated in a canoe near their Kentucky settlement. Demonstrating their own knowledge of frontier ways, the quick-witted teens left trail markers as their captives took them away, bending branches, breaking off twigs, and leaving behind leaves and berries. Their rescue team, led by Daniel Boone himself, took just two days to follow the trail and retrieve the girls. The rescuers included Flanders Calloway, Samuel Henderson, and Captain John Holder, each of whom later married one of the kidnapped girls. This event became such an integral part of frontier lore, author James Fenimore Cooper included it in his classic novel, The Last of the Mohicans. Sacagawea One of the best known women of the American West, the native-born Sacagawea gained renown for her crucial role in helping the Lewis and Clark expedition successfully reach the Pacific coast. Born in 1788 or 1789 in what is now Idaho, Sacagawea was a member of the Lemmy Band of Native American Shoshone tribe. At the age of 12, she was kidnapped by a war party of Hadasta Indians, enemies of the Shoshone and taken to their home in Hadasta Mandan villages near modern-day Bismarck, North Dakota. Around 1803, Sacagawea, along with other Shoshone women, was sold as a slave to the French-Canadian fur trader Toussaint Charbonneau. She soon became pregnant, giving birth to son Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau in February 1805. Meanwhile, after the United States government had completed the Louisiana Purchase, which added 828,000 square miles of unexplored territory to America, President Thomas Jefferson dispatched Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to chart the new land and scout the Northwest Passage to the Pacific Coast. After more than a year of planning and initial travel, the expedition reached the Hadatsa Mandan Settlement, here they met Sacagawea and Charbonneau, whose combined language skills proved invaluable, especially Sacagawea's ability to speak to the Shoshone. Sacagawea, along with her newborn baby, was the only woman to accompany the 31 permanent members of the Lewis and Clark expedition to the western edge of the nation and back. Sacagawea proved invaluable to the explorers, not just for her language skills, but also for her naturalist knowledge, calm nature, 
and ability to think quickly under pressure. When a squall nearly capsized the vessel they were traveling in, Sacagawea was the one who saved crucial papers, books, navigational instruments, medicines, and other provisions, while also managing to keep herself and her baby safe. In appreciation, Lewis and Clark named a branch of the Missouri River after Sacagawea. Sacagawea died at the age of 25, not long after giving birth to a daughter. Clark became legal guardian to both her children. Betty Zane Betty Zane lived in her native Virginia, now part of West Virginia, in the town of Wheeling which was founded in 1769 by her elder brothers, Ebenezer, Jonathan, and Silas. In September 1782, according to legend, Zane had just returned from Philadelphia where she had been attending school when Wheeling was attacked by Native Americans. All of the inhabitants crowded into Fort Henry without securing an adequate supply of gunpowder. Zane allegedly volunteered to fetch more gunpowder from her brother's fortified house some 40 to 50 yards from the fort. Two objections, that a man could run faster, she is supposed to have replied. You have not one man to spare. A woman will not be missed in the defense of the fort, and tis better for a maid than a man should die. The gates were unbarred and as Zane dashed for the house, the attackers, amazed and perhaps amused, did not fire. When Zane reappeared from the house with a supply of gunpowder, however, they realized her purpose and opened fire. Although her clothes were pierced, no bullet struck her and she regained the fort safely. The powder she delivered enabled the fort to hold out until relief arrived. Life on the frontier was a cooperative venture for all who took place in these communities. The white men and the Indian, the man and the woman, everyone held their place and their value shown. No one man can do more than one thing well, so it takes a village to build a frontier. Thank you guys for checking out this video and if you like this content, please be sure to share, like, and subscribe. If you have any subjects from frontier and American history that you would like to see on this channel, please be sure to put it in the comments section. And as always, guys, remember to get out there and explore. Thanks, guys.